Hi there, welcome to the Fierce Factor Podcast. I'm your host, Kaylee Lindholm. And I think it's time for us women to shift the conversation in business and step into our feminine leadership to do the most iconic work the aesthetic industry has ever seen. Each week, I'll be bringing a powerful dose of strategy, sarcasm, solutions, and sass that will rev up your creativity and ignite your brilliance as you link arms with me along our shared path of personal and professional growth in 20 minutes or less. Let's go. Hello, leader. Thank you for tuning into the Fierce Factor podcast. It's your host, Kaylee here, and you are here for episode 138. If you stumbled across the Fierce Factor podcast for the first time today, you are in for a treat because I'm going to pose a question today that may stimulate some thought around your approach to market communication and may even potentially expose some gaps or perhaps reinforce how intimately you know and understand and connect with your clients on a really meaningful level. So this topic, it's really an advanced lesson in marketing and brand positioning because really speaking the language of your client is key to building trust and ultimately loyalty. Remember, at the end of the day, people do business with people and they trust people who they believe can relate to them, identify with their pain points, and who can clearly communicate the value of alleviating that pain point. And trust me, when I say this is easier said than done, I mean it. (laughs) I routinely speak with aesthetic providers who feel frustrated by the way social media and the Groupon movement has commoditized our luxury industry. I literally heard a plastic surgeon say this week, everyone and their mother has an Instagram and a syringe. Ouch. (laughs) I've heard other injectors talk about the wild, wild west. Anyone can say they're a skilled injector, but are they really? And what the hell do we do about it? A girlfriend of mine used to say, don't get mad, Kaylee, get even. And it's like this. I remember watching a competitive NCAA soccer match between Loyola Marymount and Santa Clara when I was in college. The game was at LMU. My husband, who is I was dating at the time, was playing baseball there. And so I walked over to catch a few minutes of the soccer game since it was just at the field adjacent to the baseball field. And let's be honest, I'd much rather watch women's soccer, but that's a conversation for a different day. So I snuck into the LMU student section and I was like buried in a pile of these shirtless dudes with face paint. You get it, right? They were chanting at the outside midfielder, of Santa Clara. They were heckling her, calling her names, or trying to get her all riled up. And I was just waiting for her to turn to them and flip them off or something and just completely lose her cool. I mean, that was sort of their whole objective to like get her off her game. So she ignored them for a few minutes. And then the ball was passed right to her around the 20 yard line. And she took like one cut in. She juked out the LMU defender. She launched the ball into the back of the net. The score was now three nothing Santa Clara. Instead of running through the center field to celebrate with her team, she took this slow, long route along the opponent's sideline where I was posted up and slowly jogged back to her starting position. And as she came by the bleacher stands where the fans were, without looking over at us, she flashed her three fingers, index, middle, and ring finger showing a three sign, like three fingers, and then a fist showing a zero. Three zero, right? Scoreboard. She got even. She let the scoreboard speak for itself. And believe me, I've never seen a more compelling, tactful, and just like FUA of shutting up a bleacher full of hecklers in my life. And I love that. And that's like what we need to be doing to our competition or AKA this wild, wild west of Instagram pop-ups out there, right? And that's what's so beautiful about knowing who you are and what you stand for. When you have a worldview, a perspective that is recognized and adopted by your ideal client, nothing can rattle you. In our Confidence to Scale six-week business growth certification program, I teach a milestone session called Marketing Your Disruptive Philosophy. In essence, what we cover is the ideology behind thinking and speaking in a way that disrupts typical thinking. It shifts the voice behind your brand to elevate above really a sea of me-too practices out there. But this movement and messaging 
It's also about closely connecting with your customer in a way that tells them, I see you, right? It ties you to a client in a way that says, I know there's a gap here and I'm stepping up to fill it for you. You're basically saying it all. You're saying what doesn't need to be said now. And believe it or not, this is one of the most challenging concepts for business owners to grasp. We're programmed as humans to fit in. It's like a primal survival skill. You know, we think things in our heads so often, but when it comes time to say it out loud, well, that's a different story. It can feel polarizing to speak out against what is commonly accepted or held as popular belief. And in today's world, let's be real. We are all living in an era where we're doing everything we can to avoid unintendedly stimulating sensitivities and charging up human emotions. But over the past year, Team KLC has assembled an arsenal of data that proves that ruffling some feathers at the expense of losing connection with prospective or existing clients who are already misaligned with your value system might just be worth it. As progressive and innovative as aesthetics is in so many ways, I have had questions myself as I've supported hundreds of business owners who are raising thriving businesses in our industry. I question whether or not we're missing something. I mean, is it possible that we have failed to make market share gains due to missing data about consumers? This was the question in which Brad Benbow and Phil Daniel sought out to explore the answer to in their study of a newly coined concept called spirituographics. So it's essentially a discussion around the topic of culture and blind spots. Billions of dollars are spent each year trying to understand and predict data that helps us understand how consumers decide to buy. And in aesthetics, let's be honest, we're behind the eight ball. We're like, come get my Botox, filler, threads, lasers, peel, skincare, blah, 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 right? (laughs) Come on, leader. It is time to sophisticate your message and speak to your consumer on a new level. So today I want to explore this gap you may be unaware of as it relates to having an intimate awareness around your patients, purchasing drivers, their openness to investing in aesthetic procedures, and their willingness to freely rave about their five-star experiences at your practice with their friends and family. This whole idea started with a conversation that piqued my curiosity on the topic. During one of my one-on-one calls with a confidence-to-scale client out of Kansas, a conversation came up about how women of faith, women in her community, the lion chair of her patients, who are also co-members at her church, think and act as a community in a very specific way as it relates to investing in aesthetic treatments. In fact, she said to me, every consultation seems to begin with a therapy session about how aesthetics is not intended to alter your body or natural God-given genetics. It's about investing in your self-care, your wellness, your wholeness, so you can show up as a better evangelist for God and his calling for you. If you've worked with any basic marketing or branding agency, they might take you through this exercise that talks about your client avatar, right? They talk about psychographics, so how a consumer thinks, demographics, the age and gender of the consumer, and geographics, where a consumer lives. Consumer information essentially underwrites how we identify, engage, and grow our given markets. And according to Ben Bowen Daniels in their study of spiritual graphics, they quote, these frameworks have trained us to know our audience. Their traits, makeup, life experiences, and motivations all help paint a picture of the consumer and ultimately their motivations to take action. However, Despite significant advances in technology and analytics, our approach to consumer insights over time has remained relatively unchanged. Huh. So leader, think about your last interaction with a Facebook ads manager. They might put together a quick synopsis of this like ideal target audience, and it might be something like this. Female, age 30 to 50, with an income of 100K plus in a 90-mile radius. Sound familiar? <laughs> What the idea of spiritual graphics talks about is another dimension to understanding your customer, a dimension that literally shapes every single buying decision and interaction between our client in Kansas and her patients, its culture at its core. And so today, I want to briefly touch base on the impact that faith has on the aesthetic consumer. 
Recently, American Insights unveiled the latest around research demonstrating that faith-driven consumers are more likely to engage with brands that respect their values. So here they delve into several data points that show specific examples of how faith-driven consumers are eager to change their purchasing decisions based on a brand's faith compatibility. So I'd like to share with you a few highlights of some of their findings. 82% of faith-driven consumers are much more likely to shop with companies that promote Christian compatible values. 78% of faith-driven consumers would be likely to shift purchasing behavior based on a different brand's compatibility with their Christian worldview. 77% of faith-driven consumers would switch their shopping from a company not compatible with their Christian worldview to a company that is— if all other factors were equal. And finally, 75% of faith-driven consumers are likely to choose a brand based on its compatibility with a Christian worldview. So clearly, faith-driven consumers overwhelmingly seek brands that are compatible with their values. A significant percentage are also eager to encourage their friends to purchase faith-compatible brands and, importantly, are willing to take their business elsewhere if a brand or company doesn't respect their values. And when I chat with our CTS client in Kansas, her experience is a vivid reflection of this data. So why is this important? In 2012, Pew Forum reported that 80% of people worldwide and about 70% of Americans affiliate with a religion. And instead of considering religion as religious affiliation, for example, how Catholics differ from Protestants, their framework really proposes that religion affects consumer psychology and behavior through four key dimensions, beliefs, rituals, values, and community. And when you really dive into this literature and you're like me, you can't help but think of the famous Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for lunch. Back to unpacking the ideology of spiritual graphics, take any occupation of area of expertise— And eventually, that consortium of individuals will refer to itself as a community, and communities over time develop a culture that drives every form of thought and philosophy. An illustrative example being that the Jewish community, by and large, doesn't eat pork. This is a current truth in 2022 in the U.S., but it also has been historically true of Jewish people across cultures for thousands of years. The heritage of Jewish people has always considered pigs really a dirty animal, and this behavior would have been dictated far back in history by the law of Moses. The point being Jews don't eat pork, and faith is the central reason why. When I think of beliefs, rituals, values, and community, I'm reminded of the vastly different approach my sister takes to waste consumption now that she lives in Switzerland than when she grew up here in the U.S. I visited my sister earlier this year, and let me tell you, there's not one morsel of food, packaging, paper, filler, or wrapper that goes unaccounted for in the composting and recycling process. Just take a breakfast of eggs and orange juice, for example. The eggs would be cracked and cooked. The Shells would be discarded in the green compost bin. The carton would be placed in the purple paper and cardboard bin. The glass container of orange juice, and yes, it would be glass, not plastic, would be cleaned and reused. Or if it was damaged in any way, it would go into the purple glass container. You get the idea. And then, you know, over the course of the day, five to six bags of different types of waste would then be piled up into the trunk of the car. And then we would wind down the mountain and make a pit stop with a collection of waste. From there, we would all disperse and individually appropriate each piece of trash into the correct community bin where it would be picked up by the city. When my sister comes to the U.S., she laughs at the recycle bin, which is debatably effective, and the amount of waste and trash that is plowed into our landfills on a routine basis. These beliefs she has about consumption and preservation will ultimately inform the way she buys products and packaging both at home and here. And the community values around the system when she goes back to Switzerland will inform the way manufacturers design and package their products to those consumers. And a final example I'll share would be the KitchenAid and beliefs, rituals, values, and community of Made in America. Studies show that a brand such as 
This one, who binds itself to a perspective like Made in America, speaks to a country's founding principles. Companies who display or use this type of symbolism to represent this will really make positive gains among that segment of consumers who value that concept. Now, the moral of the story here, leader, is that there's a much deeper interest at play for your clients as consumers than just seeking aesthetic treatments. And taking the time to think through how your customers align themselves from a value perspective, from a faith perspective, can be the key differentiating factor that allows you to show up with your disruptive philosophy. You can connect with them in a way that really tells your most valued client that you are the one and only provider for them. Okay, leader? No more complaints about competition. This game is between you and your customer. And if you need some help working through this ideology or artfully, skillfully anchoring your brand to its purpose and deploying this to the world, well, you know where to find me. Okay, leader, thank you for tuning into this episode. I will see you same place, same time next week. Wait, before you go. Hey, if you're vibing with this conversation and you want to join me on my mission to help 100 inspiring and intentional women cross the next million dollar milestone in their business this year, or leader, maybe you want to become one of them, head over to Facebook and join our free community, The Fierce Factor Society. Over there, we're taking this conversation to an elevated level, get access to resource guides, podcast supplements, guideposts, and direct communication with me, my expert team, and of course, a society of fierce women making big moves and disrupting the status quo in aesthetic wellness. You can link directly through the show notes or head to Facebook and search the Fierce Factor Society. See you there, goddess.